Okay, well, welcome to this discussion over Chapter 14. Uh, this will be over the autonomic nervous system. We've been spending quite a bit of time talking about the nervous system. We've already gone over parts of the brain. Uh, we've talked about uh, different regions of the brain and, and what they're responsible for. This chapter is a continuation of that as we consider the automatic, those autonomic uh, portions of our nervous system. You should definitely look through the first three modules within your Martini textbook as a review of that. And I'll just flash through right now as just a quick reminder of the material that should be very familiar to you from last semester. Now that's true of most of this. I'm really not going to be adding to this conversation much than what I've already shared with you last semester. The other thing to keep in mind is where we're heading. Uh, this is the beginning of our chapter two, our exam two materials. And exam two is going to cover the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. And we'll spend a lot of time comparing and contrasting these two very important systems that help maintain our homeostasis. And then we'll finish up with a little bit on chapter six, and that'll be about skeletal, uh, bone, uh, metabolism, and homeostasis, really a continuation of the endocrine system. So let's just take a look uh, through the first couple sections of this. And recall that the autonomic nervous system can be divided up into um, the uh, sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions. So let's kind of go all the way back. What we've studied so far was largely our somatic nervous system. In other words, your conscious control and even subconscious control over the skeletal muscles of your body. And we looked at some pathways, and we talked about how there's an upper motor neuron and a lower, a lower motor neuron that is sending that information from the brain down through your spinal cord and out to your skeletal muscles. So normally we would talk about that being your um, voluntary nervous system, um, neurons being sent down from the motor strip, from your precentral uh, gyrus, and going down and speaking to your skeletal muscles, okay? So that's what we normally think of as voluntary. The autonomic nervous system is going to work with visceral functions, things that are mostly outside of your awareness, and this is going to be mostly integrated through your hypothalamus, and we'll see that uh, motor neurons that are going to cause us to move involuntarily or uh, instructions going to our smooth muscles, our cardiac muscle, to our glands, will definitely uh, pass through the hypothalamus. Uh, remember that for this system, there's always two neurons. There's going to be a preganglionic and a postganglionic neuron. Here, uh, Martini is just referring to it as the ganglionic neuron. So the preganglionic neuron, again, is going to be um, in the brainstem or the spinal cord, and it is going to be part of those uh, reflex arcs, things over which you don't have control and it's going to leave the CNS and synapse with a ganglionic or postganglionic neuron. The postganglionic neuron is then going to take that information and travel to the effector. And remember that for the autonomic nervous system, the effectors here are not skeletal muscle, but instead are cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, glands, and added to the list, I don't think I shared this with you last year, adipose tissue. There's a lot of things going on in our fat tissue that are just now beginning to be understood. So remember that the, the pathways now, you're going to be sending information down from uh, the motor strip, and it's only going to go to the ganglion, wherever that ganglion is, um, out to the ganglion, and then to the effector. So there's two neurons in series that are involved here with these responses. So that should be a review. And then again, we know that the autonomic nervous system is divided up into those two portions, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And these terms should be familiar to you. They typically have opposing effects. So they're usually opposite, but we'll see a couple of times where they actually work together. And we'll also see some tissues that are only innervated by one or the other division. So while they usually have yin-yang effects, uh, sometimes that is not always true. And I'll also mention along the way the enteric nervous system, which is really a third division of the autonomic nervous system, and these are the nerve endings that are in your intestines. And in fact, you have ner more neurons in your gut 
than you do in your brain. So we'll talk about the enteric nervous system just a little bit. So remember that the sympathetic nervous system, that's your fight or flight response, right? And we also can call it thoracolumbar division because this area is coming from the, the thoracic and lumbar uh, nerves. Then the parasympathetic, this is your rest and digest, and it is craniosacral because, again, it's coming from the cranial nerves and from the sacral nerves, a pair of places, if you will. So that'll help you remember that. And the other facts here uh, about their axons and their ganglia, please review that information. That's all shown here, though, pretty succinctly. So on the left-hand side is the sympathetic nervous system. Again, uh, thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord. The preganglionic neuron is rather short. It goes just over to the ganglion. And then the postganglionic would be relatively long going off to the effector. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system, you have a pair of places, the cranium and the sacral nerves, and they're going to travel out pretty far to the ganglion before synapsing with the postganglionic neuron, and that's usually much closer to or even within the wall of the effector organ. The cranial nerves that are involved with the parasympathetic nervous system, three, seven, nine, and ten. Those four cranial nerves are involved with parasympathetic responses. And that should kind of juggle a little mind, a little, a little uh, memory. Uh, the third nerve, think about uh, the effects it has on the pupil. This is going to vasoconstrict your eye, or uh, dial, uh, sorry, it's going to constrict your pupil uh, when you are in a rest or digest moment. And then seven, nine, and ten, when you think of those three together, you think of, of uh, taste and salivation and all that's involved with um, gustatory responses. And then that other division that, that I don't remember mentioning much last semester is the enteric nervous system. You have over 100 million neurons located within the walls of your digestive tract. They are going to be influenced by both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. They use the same neurotransmitters that we'll discuss as we go through this, and we'll talk more about it again when we get to the digestive system later on in the course. But you can see in this picture all of the nerves that are intimately woven around the intestinal organ. So we'll talk, again, more about that enteric nervous system at the appropriate time. You also can see here um, these ganglia. This is all of the autonomic nervous system. And you can see all these yellow ganglia, right, and these plexuses, these groups of nerves that are traveling to all of the important organs. So cardiac, your lungs, um, going down to your esophagus and your digestive system structures, all of that is under autonomic control, and there's extensive uh, innervation down to those structures through groups of nerves called a plexus. And then finally, also as a review, is uh, about the, the sympathetic chain that's going down along the vertebra and uh, the fact that the medulla... Uh, of the adrenal glands. The adrenal medulla is, in fact, really just a big ganglion when you think about its connection between the nervous system and the endocrine system. And we'll be comparing and contrasting and discussing that quite a bit as we move forward. So I've already shown this to you in the picture, but in the sympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic fibers are short and the postganglionic fibers are long. And... Uh, What's going on here? Again, you're, we're talking about the sympathetic, so we're talking about things coming from the thoracic and lumbar region, and they're going to go to a number of ganglia. These ganglia are going to be relatively close, and then going out to the target. Okay, so we have the preganglionic fibers, relatively short, the postganglionic fibers, relatively long, and that um, when these signals go to the adrenal medulla, here they're going to release some of the hormones that are involved with, uh, that go into the general circulation. So we see here now a connection between the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, and the endocrine system as we discuss the release of hormones into the body. The 
The sympathetic nervous system, you know, is a fight or flight response, and you can appreciate what happens when the bear is chasing you, when you're scared. These are all the things that happen. Your, your mental alertness goes up. You're more aware of things. You have a higher metabolic rate. You're going to have a decrease to your digestive and urinary functions. You're going to uh, start breaking down energy reserves within your tissues. Your respiratory passages are going to dilate. You're going to get more air down to your lungs. Your heart rate's going to go up. Your blood pressure is going to go up and you're going to sweat more. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, you've got some ganglia that are terminal, far away, or actually within the wall of the target organ. That's referred to as intramural ganglia. So again, you've got a pair of places, craniosacral. The cranio are referring to four cranial nerves, three, seven, nine, and ten. And again, what's going on? Parasympathetic, your pupil is going to get smaller when you're relaxed. The salivary glands, the tear glands are all going to be activated by seven and nine. And ten, um, think about the effects of slowing down your heart rate, slowing down your respiratory rate. So that would be involved with the vagus nerve. And then also, uh, when you think about parasympathetic, you're thinking about the fact that your digestive and urinary and reproductive organs are now uh, going to have increased blood flow. And so you can appreciate those structures are coming off more the sacral nerves. So the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest system, sort of the opposite, right? We've got decreased metabolic rate, decreased blood pressure and heart rate, um, increase in salivary and digestive secretions, an increase in motility of food and, and food stuff and blood flow through the digestive tract, and stimulation of the urinary and uh, the digestive system for defecation. So that should be largely review. Now, the rest of this, much of it also will be review, but let's just take a look at the innervation uh, within the sympathetic nervous system. Now remember, a ramus is a branch, so every spinal nerve has a gray ramus carrying sympathetic postganglionic fibers, and these are going to go to the body wall and the limbs. We'll see this. In the head and neck, those postganglionic sympathetic fibers are from the superior cervical sympathetic ganglia, and we'll see those. Um, and they're innervated by the same 3, 7, 9, and 10. There's also uh, three groups of splanchnic nerves. Now, these are the nerves that are going to feed your internal organs, your viscera. There is a cardiopulmonary group. It's going to go to the heart and lungs. There's an abdominal pelvic group. It's going to go down to all regions of your abdominal pelvic cavity. And there's a pelvic group going down to the lower structures uh, in the lumbar and sacral regions. So when you think about um, the sympathetic nervous system, this is a great image to look at, 14-4. So what this does is it reminds us of all that's going on. So you've got signals coming off from the spinal cord, thoracic, down to lumbar. Those signals, the red, are the preganglionic fibers. Again, they're relatively short. They're only going as far as the ganglion. And you see these sympathetic ganglia all up and down the, the vertebral column. So the preganglionic fiber is very short. The postganglionic fiber is much longer, as you can see here. Now, these signals go to these paravertebral ganglia, but there are also other ganglia, um, the splanchnic ganglia that I just mentioned. And what else is happening when you are in sympathetic mode? Well, the eye, what's going to happen here? Right, you're going to vasodilate. Your eye's going to get really big. You're not going to salivate as much. In fact, you're going to get a, a very thick, mucousy sort of saliva. Uh, that saliva is going to be protective, though, because as you're breathing faster, you're going to tend to dry out your airways. So that thick, mucousy secretion that you get when you're scared, like you're about to do public speaking and your mouth goes dry and you get all cotton mouth, that's actually a protective against your airways from drying out from the rapid breathing rate. 
your heart rate is going to go up, respiration rate is going to go up, but liver, stomach, pancreas, intestines, kidney, all that and bladder is going to go down, isn't it? So we're going to see that the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems don't just stimulate on, they also are more like a rheostat. There's a plus and a minus, an up and a down effect. Remember that when you're scared, you're also going to have the hair on your skin go up. So there's going to be erector pili muscles are going to be pulled, and there's also going to be increased sweating from your sweat glands. There'll also be more signals going to the adipose tissue uh, to help release some energy as well. This is versus the parasympathetic. As already mentioned, we've got the vagus nerve. Okay, about 75% of all the information is going to be going through the vagus nerve. And then the rest of it will be coming out of the sacral nerves, sacral region of the spinal cord. And that's going to go to the pelvic nerves, and that's going to go to your kidneys, your bladder, uh, some of your intestine, and the reproductive organs. Again, just think of what the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions are doing and what systems are affecting, and this will all make very, very good sense. So here's a good schematic of the parasympathetic nervous system. Again, very, very long preganglionic fibers. The ganglion is in or near the organ itself, and then a relatively very, very short postganglionic. So in a parasympathetic nervous system surge, your lacrimal glands are going to increase your tear production. You're going to increase your saliva for digesting food. Heart rate's going to go down. Lungs are going to relax, less respiration rate. Your gallbladder, stomach, spleen, pancreas, intestines, kidney, all that's going to be up, regulated. You're going to have more activity of those systems, uh, as well as blood flow to the reproductive organs will be increased. So the only neurotransmitter that I've really talked about this semester has been acetylcholine. And we saw acetylcholine show up uh, with muscle. It's the most abundant neurotransmitter because it is the one that controls your muscle. And acetylcholine, we'll see, is also involved in the autonomic nervous system. Well, let's turn now to different, nervous, uh, nervous, different neurotransmitters. In the sympathetic nervous system, there are going to be receptors for adrenergic receptors, okay? And these adrenergic receptors will be located in the membranes of any of the target cells that will respond to these uh, sympathetic signals. There's going to be two types, alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. Now, the neurotransmitters that are going to be affecting these receptors, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. So we're going to see that the norepinephrine more greatly stimulates the alpha receptors, whereas epinephrine stimulates both equally. So epinephrine and norepinephrine, up until now, I never really differentiated them. I never uh, told you there was much difference in them, but they do have different effects. But I think everyone recognizes when they hear the word epinephrine that we're talking about a heightened sense of activity. Uh, people carry EpiPens to increase their uh, uh, airways uh, if they're having an allergic response. So we have the idea that epinephrine is making us, you know, more active, more hyper. Now there's also um, norepinephrine involved in the sympathetic system. We'll see that it's um, released, and those are mostly the alpha receptors near those terminals, and these these signals are very quick, so they're going to be lasting just for a short time. Whereas, if we're talking about more generalized sympathetic activity, uh, this is going to involve norepinephrine and epinephrine. Uh, this is going to be released by the adrenal medulla. It's going to affect, again, both alpha and beta receptors throughout the body. And you're going to have even more of the epinephrine released in the norepinephrine. So you're going to have a greater response on these beta receptors. Hold on and I'll tell you about those beta receptors in a moment. These levels can stay elevated for quite some time. So if you have an epinephrine or norepinephrine surge from the adrenal glands, it's hard to come down from that. You don't have a quick way of recovering from that because this neurotransmitter has been released through the blood 
and it has a certain amount of time it's going to stay in the blood. So there's going to be quite a, a longer effect of these neurotransmitters once they're released into the general uh, bloodstream. So let's take a look at these receptors. Alpha receptors, again, um, stimulated mostly by norepinephrine and equally by epinephrine. And how do they work? Well, I've been kind of bouncing around this idea of G proteins. I mentioned last time that um, your bitter receptors and your umami receptors for taste were G receptors. And it basically, again, the idea is that the, the neurotransmitter is going to bind to a receptor on the plasma membrane of the cell and inside the cell cause an effect. And what's going to happen is that typically the alpha-1 receptors are going to be excitatory. The alpha-2 receptors are going to be inhibitory. So alpha-1, excitatory. Alpha-2 are going to be inhibitory receptors. So here's the idea. You've got this neurotransmitter, norepinephrine. It's traveling uh, through the blood or is being released by a nearby cell. And there's an alpha receptor. That alpha receptor will pick up that norepinephrine and cause an activation of the G proteins. Now, if, this doesn't say what kind of alpha receptor it is, if it's an alpha-1 receptor, then it is an excitatory signal, and what will happen is that it will cause um, more signals to be generated within the cell. It'll cause a release of calcium. Well, you heard about calcium at the end of, of axons. So you know there's something that goes on with calcium inside the cell, and that will cause smooth muscles to contract and glands to secrete. Okay, so those are the effectors, positive effectors, of the um, alpha receptor. Now, if it's an alpha-2 receptor, then I told you it's inhibitory, and so you're actually going to reduce the level of these secondary message molecules, and you inhibit these signals within the cell. So again, it uh, depends upon the tissue. It depends on what kind of receptor this, the tissue has. Does the cell have an alpha-1 or an alpha-2? If it sees norepinephrine and it's an alpha-1 receptor, it'll be an excitatory signal. And if it's an alpha-2 receptor, it will be an uh, inhibitory signal. Now, the beta receptors, okay, um, they're generally going to be stimulated by epinephrine. They're located in your muscles, heart, lungs, liver. And they also work through G proteins, this sort of this magic box, if you will. And they come in three types, beta-1, beta-2, and beta-3. So there were two alphas, alpha 1 and alpha 2. There's three betas, beta 1, 2, and 3. Again, let's take a look at this. So now we have epinephrine is the neurotransmitter. It would bind to a beta receptor on this plasma membrane of the cell, and it would activate through G proteins a number of things. Um, what they do, all these G proteins, take ATP and make it, make a molecule called cyclic AMP. Now, if it's a beta-1 receptor, then it's going to stimulate cardiac muscle and increase overall tissue metabolism. If it's a beta-2 receptor, it's going to cause um, a relaxation of smooth muscle in the respiratory passages and a relaxation of the blood vessels in the skeletal muscle. If it's a beta-3 receptor, it's going to cause a release of fatty acids from fat tissue for other tissues to use. So again, what we're seeing is that one molecule, epinephrine, can travel through the blood and have multiple different effects on the tissues because of what receptors are found in those particular tissues. So epinephrine can affect the cardiac muscle, it can affect digestion, digestion and it can affect fat metabolism based upon what receptor the tissue has. Now those are the sympathetic neuro, uh, neurotransmitters. We talk about epinephrine and norepinephrine. On the parasympathetic side, we're going to be dealing with acetylcholine. So here's our friend again, acetylcholine. Now acetylcholine is going to bind to not adrenergic receptors, but to cholinergic receptors. And there's two types of these cholinergic receptors, nicotinic 
and muscarinic. Okay, nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. So what do these cholinergic, these nicotinic receptors do? We'll start there. Well, the nicotinic receptors are found on the postganglionic neurons. They're found in the adrenal medulla, and they're found, as you know, in skeletal muscle. They are always excitatory. <clears throat> okay, so nicotinic receptors are always going to turn something on. And they got their name because nicotine, right, a molecule in cigarette smoke, for example, nicotine actually um, is what turns on these receptors. It was first discovered that way. And so, unfortunately, we have some vocabulary we have to deal with. So we have the nicotinic receptors. So here we go. Here's acetylcholine. It's floating um, through the blood or next to a tissue. It's going to bind to this receptor. Okay. We've seen a receptor like that before. <clears throat> now, in skeletal muscle, that, would, that receptor would have opened up a sodium channel, right, and talked about creating a local potential in the next neuron. In this case, the acetylcholine is also, right, we see it again, sodium's going to come in, and that sodium's going to have an effect on the cell. This is a nicotinic receptor. Now, what about the muscarinic receptors? Well, they also work through G proteins. Um, they are going to be involved with glands, and um, they're going to be either excitatory or inhibitory. And they were first characterized using a poisonous mushroom and the molecule muscarine. So muscarinic receptors were first studied with mushroom toxins, but we found out that this was a whole class of cholinergic receptors within the body. Again, we're kind of stuck with this unfortunate, difficult naming. So here's what goes on with this situation. We've got an acetylcholine molecule, a couple of them, binding this time to a muscarinic receptor. This works through a G protein. On the inside, it could either have a positive or a negative effect on the metabolism of that cell. It just depends on what tissue it is and whether or not acetylcholine is going to be excitatory or if it's going to be inhibitory. So let's, as you're looking back, compare the alpha and beta receptors and compare the nicotinic with the muscarinic receptors. Okay. And I mentioned about beta blockers. Go back and look at beta. Uh, see what kind of effects beta would have, specifically um, the beta-1, and see how, if you block beta-1, how it might help a person who has high blood pressure. Okay, so what's going on here? Let's talk about the sympathetic division. This is your fight-or-flight response. And you're going to release norepinephrine, and you're going to distribute norepinephrine and epinephrine through the blood throughout the entire body. Again, the effects are going to be based upon what specific receptors there are. Sympathetic activation is going to occur when you're in a time of crisis. Um, it's going to be controlled largely through the hypothalamus. Um, again, you've got effects everywhere, even affecting the central nervous system. So you don't want to think that the um, sympathetic nervous system only affects autonomic things, but it also can have an effect on the central nervous system. So during a sympathetic activation, right, increased alertness, you're kind of feeling on edge, maybe you've got a lot of energy, uh, maybe too much, maybe you're, for a moment, even insensitized to pain. Uh, your respiratory rates, your cardiovascular rates are up, heart rate's up, blood pressure's up, muscle tone is increased, and your energy stores are being broken down so that you have more energy for this fight or flight response. So the preganglionic neuron is going to start in the central nervous system. Remember, it's thoracic lumbar. And it's going to come out, and this yellow is the ganglion. There, it's going to synapse with other neurons. Here we see that uh, if it's going to the adrenal medulla, that it could be releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine directly into the bloodstream. That would allow it to go all over the body. Or it could very specifically be 
uh, have that signal sent down a post-ganglionic fiber and release neurotransmitters directly on a target. So we see sympathetic can be very uh, general, sending the neurotransmitter to the bloodstream, or it can be very specific, sending a signal directly to the tissue. So these are the facts you want to know, right? As you're comparing and contrasting, this should be review. Uh, sympathetic division, thoracolumbar. The ganglia are near the vertebral column. They have a short preganglionic axon, and it always uses acetylcholine. I didn't mention this earlier, but acetylcholine is used by both systems, sympathetic and parasympathetic, for the preganglionic fiber. Now, the postganglionic fiber, this is where it gets different. It's a much longer fiber. And you are going to be using norepinephrine most of the time. You will see examples where you'll see nitric oxide or acetylcholine. And again, typically, this is fight or flight. This is going to stimulate your metabolism, increase your alertness, prepare you for emergencies. Always, 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 you're comparing and contrasting as you go through this. Now, under normal conditions, as you're listening to this right now, neither system is completely activated. Right? They're both continuously working. I don't want you to think that, oh, for some moments the sympathetic nervous system is completely in control, and other times the parasympathetic nervous system is completely in control. No, no, no. They both are working continuously together like a rheostat, up and down, slowly, up and down, back and forth. Now, it is true that anabolic, right, uh, when we're thinking about the parasympathetic nervous system, we are thinking about rest and digest, so in that situation, it is more anabolic. You are definitely um, building up energy reserves, and uh, you're going to be storing extra lipids or glycogen, making glycogen, as well as just storing up energy for later use. So during parasympathetic moments or activation, the pupils would be more restricted. That was cranial nerve number three. Your digestive secretion, salivary glands, will be increased. That was 7 and 9. Um, you're going to release more hormones to increase the absorption of nutrients into your cells. You're going to have uh, more blood flow going to the, to the genitals for sexual arousal. There'll be greater motility through the digestive system, uh, more stimulation and coordination of defecation, more coordination of the bladder for urination, constriction of the respiratory passageways. You won't be breathing as deeply or uh, as often during a parasympathetic activation, and your heart rate goes down, as does how forcefully it is contracting. So the cartoon, the schematic of the parasympathetic, again, from the cranial or sacral region, long preganglionic axon going to a ganglion, and then the postganglionic axon is near or within the wall of the target. Always, 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 the first, the first neurotransmitter will be acetylcholine, and then on the target, it could be norepinephrine or epinephrine. So again, take that cartoon and put these characteristics in there. This is craniosacral from the brainstem in the sacral region. Typically, the ganglion is far away and is within the wall of the target, intramural. Relatively long, preganglionic, using acetylcholine. Relatively short, postganglionic, using acetylcholine. And this is all about rest and digest, energy storage, relaxation, nutrient uptake. So let's figure out what's going on here. What uh, roles does the autonomic nervous system have on maintaining um, your homeostasis during unconsciousness? We'll also take a look at um, sometimes both of these systems, sympathetic and parasympathetic, are working together, dual. We'll look at somehow how they work in opposite situations. We'll look at the baroreceptors and the chemoreceptors and then we'll finally finish up with the hypothalamus, putting all this all together. 
So there are really two systems that largely help you maintain your homeostasis. Clearly, the autonomic nervous system, working through sympathetic and parasympathetic responses, and as we're going to go into the next chapter, the endocrine system. They're both working tremendously hard behind the scenes. Of course, the autonomic nervous system is without your conscious awareness, and we're going to be controlling things like the digestive, cardiovascular, respiratory, and reproductive systems without real any input from your mind. Yes, you can influence these systems, but these systems are largely going to con uh, occur without your conscious control. So as we see in this information, some sort of stimulus coming in to a receptor in the body. That information is going to go up a sensory pathway and go up to the processing centers of the brain. This information is going to go over to your subconscious level. Think hypothalamus brainstem. And then typically, from this point, it'll be coming right back down. The motor pathways, either somatic or visceral. Yes, it can inform your consciousness, but only a small amount of your autonomic stimuli actually make it to your consciousness. Only when uh, your consciousness is needed to be made aware does it, does it enter into your consciousness. Normally, these autonomic systems are working below this line, completely subconscious. And again, autonomic nervous system is going to be affecting your smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, fat. Your somatic side would require uh, coordination with your cerebrum, your motor strip, and your cerebellum to control your skeletal muscles. Now, there is this term called tone. Uh, in muscle, we'll talk about tone. Tone is the fact that even when your muscles are at rest, they're still contracting to a certain point. In the nervous system, uh, the tone is sort of the idea. Autonomic tone. How much continual, continuous activity is there? And uh, this is maintained sort of all the time. So you're never completely shutting down the autonomic nervous system. There's always some influence of this system on your organs. So that's tone. And then innervation. Again, most, but not all, of your organs are receiving dual innervation. They're receiving signals from the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions. Some only get one or the other, so they're not duly innervated. But most are, um, some organs are only sympathetic, okay? And we'll talk more about those in a moment. So what happens? Here's a difference. Again, you're comparing and contrasting. So when you think about things that happen automatically, so we've got the lacrimal glands making tears. During a parasympathetic, your eyes get more secretions. They, they tear more. Um, now, your lacrimal glands are not innervated at all by the sympathetic nerves. So in other words, either they're going to secrete parasympathetic or no signals at all, and they would simply secrete less under sympathetic. Let's think about dilation. During parasympathetic, constriction of the pupil, smaller, whereas when you're scared, dilation of the pupil. When you are scared, that dilation also allows you to see further away. right? So fight or flight, you better be able to focus far, far away on whatever it is that's in danger to you, whereas during the parasympathetic, during the rest and digest, you're actually, your eyes are actually more for close vision. Sweat glands. Well, what's going on? During sympathetic, you're going to sweat more. Hmm. The sweat glands aren't even innervated by the parasympathetic nervous system. So again, we're seeing some very specific examples. How about your blood vessels going to your skin, your muscles, your heart, lungs? All of those are under sympathetic and they're not innervated at all by parasympathetic. Okay. Um, during sympathetic, your heart is going to increase its rate of contraction how, and how forcefully it's contracting. Now we see that in a parasympathetic, your heart rate will go down. Your force of contraction will go down, and your blood pressure will go down. Other examples? Airways. Okay. 
increase the diameter and increase your mucus when you're breathing fast, when you're resting and digesting, your airway is smaller and you don't have any uh, secretion going to the mucus glands of the respiratory tract. And then I think the digestive system makes good sense. Sympathetic, the sphincters along the way are constricted. They're not opening. Digestive system is slower, not as deliberate. Whereas when you are in rest and digest, those sphincters are more dilating. So more movement of food through the digestive system. Decrease activity here, increase activity here. Inhibited secretory glands, stimulated secretory glands. Breakdown of glycogen, making of glycogen. Decreased exocrine, increased exocrine secretion. So these would all be uh, the ideas where you've got opposite effects going on. Again, compare and contrast. Kidney. You're going to constrict the sphincter and not have as much urination, not as much filtration going on, whereas when you are in parasympathetic, you can tense the bladder more and re release the sphincters to uh, urinate more. Reproductive. Uh, this is important. This is one of those dual arrangements. In the male reproductive system, the sympathetic allows for the ejaculation, whereas the parasympathetic allows for erection. You may hear point and shoot for this. So for erection, point, parasympathetic. For shoot, sympathetic, um, for ejaculation. So point and shoot. And then the female reproductive system, similarly, um, there can be different hormones going on with the parasympathetic nervous system, but uh, the, the male reproductive system is more cleanly uh, laid out when you think about sympathetic and parasympathetic. In the fat, during sympathetic, you're releasing fatty acids and releasing energy, and nothing's going on from parasympathetic. During sympathetic, more muscle contraction, nothing really going on in parasympathetic. So a lot of these are not duly innervated. Now, let's talk about a really simple example, though, where it is duly innervated and where I think we all understand this. So you know the heart has cardiac muscle. We've said that muscle, cardiac muscle is a autonomic tissue, involuntary tissue. There is in the heart their own pacemaker cells. So the heart is going to contract. It's going to be influenced by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. But the actual initiation of the heart rate is by pacemakers. We'll talk about those when we get to the cardiovascular system. So here we have opposing effects. We're going to see that acetylcholine will reduce heart rate, whereas norepinephrine will accelerate heart rate. Right? So we're going to decrease heart rate with parasympathetic. We're going to increase heart rate with sympathetic. Small amounts of both of these neurotransmitters are constantly being released. And so Again, it's more like a rheostat, a, a little wheel that you're spinning up and down, up and down. Rarely are you dominated by one system completely. Now, when you're resting, parasympathetic effects dominate. That is, a lower heart rate. So looking at your heart rate on a graph, 72 sort of being the, the baseline. At rest, everything's good. Um, you've got both sympathetic and parasympathetic effects, but parasympathetic is in charge. Now, let's increase the parasympathetic. You're really chilling. You're really relaxing. Okay, so the heart rate goes down, comes back up. Now, you're going to um, have the sympathetic nervous system take over for a while. Heart rate goes up. Uh, maybe you're thinking about something, concerned about something, scared about something. And then, let's think what happens when you're really, really fight or flight, and the heart rate goes up much, much higher. So we see this effect of both systems influencing the heart. So that is dual innervation when they're both, both sympathetic and parasympathetic, are having an effect. And um, look at this question here about cold days and blood flow to your, to your body and how it's conserving heat. Now, we've also talked about reflexes in the past semester. Uh, you've got visceral reflexes. Uh, this would be, um, you know, reflexes going to your gut for 
uh, digestion, etc. All of these will be polysynaptic. In other words, there will be many synapses involved. And all these reflexes will have a receptor. There will be a sensory neuron that will carry that information into the brainstem. They'll be processing by one or more interneurons, and then there will be motor neurons um, that send the signal out. If it's going to your viscera, then there will be that two-neuron system, the pre- and post-ganglionic. Now, there's also reflexes that are going to bypass the CNS altogether. Uh, this is where the spinal cord uh, does this all on its own, or where the brainstem does this and where when you don't have the CNS involved, this is where the, the autonomic nervous system is really kind of doing what it normally does. That is not really affecting your consciousness. So again, we're going to have um, the interneuron synapsing, and this will be very, very localized, a very, very small thing, and we'll see this in the enteric nervous system. Very, very short reflexes, very specific control of a localized area. So here's what that looks like. So you've got a stimulus, comes in, there's our little unipolar sensory neuron that we remember, the afferent or sensory fibers. It's going to travel um, to a ganglion, an autonomic ganglion, and then an outgoing postganglionic neuron going to the tissue. So this would be a complete reflex. I've completely skipped the CNS. You don't see the spinal cord or brain mentioned here at all. So the sensory goes right to the ganglion. Now that's a short reflex. Here's a long reflex, and this is what we more think about. You're going to have a sensory neuron bringing information into the CNS. There are going to be interneurons that process it, and then there are going to be motor neurons that are going to send it to the effector. Um, this is how most of our organs will be uh, involved with visceral reflexes. So here, you have your stimulus. It's coming in. There's your dorsal root ganglion. There's our sensory neuron. We're going to come in to the back door, the dorsal root of the spinal cord. There we're going to talk to an interneuron, synapse down, now, secondly, to a motor neuron. That motor neuron is going to go as far as the ganglion, the preganglionic neuron will, and then the postganglionic neuron going all the way to the effector. So here we see, again, polysynaptic. There's one, two, three, four neurons involved in this relatively simple reflex. So what are some of these visceral reflexes? Well, I can have sympathetic reflexes. So if there's low light reaching the eye, what, do you, what, what happens? Your pupils will dilate, right? That's a sympathetic reflex. Um, so it doesn't just have to be the bear chasing you, and wow, your eyes go huge, but even just everyday moments, your pupils are, ref are getting bigger and smaller. Um, ejaculation, I've already told you a moment ago, was a sympathetic response in the male. There are also changes in your blood vessels and in how hard and how fast your heart is pumping. Those are all sympathetic. On the parasympathetic, right, we would have relaxation of sphincters for defecation and urination, constriction of pupils, right? So if the light is bright, then you're going to constrict your pupils. You don't want to be overstimulated. Swallowing, think about eating and coughing. All this is um, related to parasympathetic. Baroreceptors would be there to reduce the heart rate. We'll talk about those. And again, increased secretions and uh, erection uh, in sexual arousal. Now, there's also interoceptors. Interoceptors would be all those receptors that are inside the body, and these are going to come in different types. You're going to have some introceptors that respond to pain, nociceptors, some to temperature, thermoreceptors, touch, pressure, baroreceptors, and chemicals, 
chemoreceptors. So I mentioned this nucleus in passing. Uh, this is the solitary nuclei, or nucleus, singular. And we're going to see that this is where the part of the brain where most of your sensory information from interoreceptors is done at the subconscious level. So this is the nucleus within the spinal cord. It's in the brain stem called the solitary nuclei, or nucleus. And again, we'll see that this is a processing area, and you'll see where it is in a moment within the brain stem. Usually, this information rarely goes up to your higher centers, so it's not going to go up, and uh, you're not going to be made aware of these things, and it's not going to result in a motor response. So again, all of that internal signals, right? all those internal signals are going to, from the viscera, all these interoceptors are going to travel, and they're going to travel to the solitary nucleus. Okay, so it's, it's on the side of the medulla oblongata, and it's not going to go up to your consciousness. It's all going to be dealt with at the unconscious level. Now, baroreceptors, we've seen those before. Baroreceptors are going to measure pressure, or in this case, really more stretch. So this we're dealing with uh, baroreceptors. You have baroreceptors in your stomach. As your stomach fills, they tell you that you're full. You have baroreceptors in your bladder. As your bladder fills, it stretches. You have baroreceptors in your heart. As the chambers fill with blood, they're being stretched. So they're always going to uh, feel pressure, and increased pressure is, for a baroreceptor, going to increase the rate of action potentials that will be generated. So we'll see them again. Oh, there's also baroreceptors um, in your blood vessels. Okay, and I've already mentioned uh, bladder, gut, and I didn't mention your lungs, but they're also there as well. So the baroreceptors are very, very important in monitoring your blood pressure on your major vessels. You have baroreceptors very specifically in the carotid artery. In the carotid artery, artery specifically in a little area called the carotid sinus. That's where the uh, carotid artery splits into the internal and external carotid. In the aorta, in the aortic arch. And this is going to make a major uh, influence on your cardiac function and on your blood flow changes that occur through your tissues. You also have baroreceptors uh, in your lung. They're going to be monitoring how much your lungs are stretching as you're breathing in heavily. And again, as I mentioned, around your bladder and around your gut, you have um, more baroreceptors measuring the stretch of those tissues. So again, baroreceptors right here, the carotid um, sinus and the aortic sinus. Uh, here. You've got some around your lungs, around your gut, around your intestines, around your bladder. Places where pressure can be an important measurement. Now, the baroreceptors aren't working alone. They're also working with chemoreceptors. These are going to be looking for changes in concentration of specific chemicals. And we'll give a couple of examples of those, but uh, chemoreceptors are going to respond to CO2 levels or acid levels or oxygen levels and they will, like baroreceptors, send action potentials in response to those chemical changes. Now those chemoreceptors are located in similar places. Uh, there are chemoreceptors in the carotid bodies, similar to where we were just a moment ago with the baroreceptors, in the aortic bodies, up in the aortic arch, and there are other chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata. Now, the medulla oblongata, uh, remember, is um, uh, going to be bathed in part by your cerebral spinal fluid. So the medulla and the chemoreceptors there are actually measuring the pH of your cerebral spinal fluid, whereas the carotid bodies and aortic bodies will be measuring the pH and CO2 levels of your blood. Okay, so a moment ago we had baroreceptors looking at pressure, now we have chemoreceptors looking at pH and CO2 levels of your fluid 
What's different here is that the medulla oblongata is checking the pH concentration of your CSF, and the other two are checking your pH and CO2 levels of your blood, plasma. So way up in the hypothalamus again, we've got a chemoreceptor checking for CSF, and then we've got the two involved with plasma around the heart. Now, the chemoreceptors, um, some of them are traveling through information through cranial nerve number 9, and some are traveling through cranial nerve number 10. Okay, so 9 and 10 are involved with these receptors. Just kind of blow up this. Um, right here, here's the carotid, the common carotid, and where it goes up and splits into the external and internal carotid arteries, that is where these carotid body and where these chemoreceptors are found. So if your blood pressure is too high, then your aorta would be stretched, your aorta would be stretched, your um, blood flow going to the brain would be increased, and these baroreceptors would, would notice that increased pressure, and what do you think they would do? If the pressure is too high on the heart, then those signals are going to tell the brain to do what? Slow down, right? Slow down the pressure, uh, maybe even cause um, a reduction of fluid in those chambers. And we talked about that hormone ANH um, earlier, and we'll talk more about it next time, how there are hormones also in the heart that are going to help regulate blood pressure. Now let's talk about the uh, visceral responses again. Where is all this happening? Where is the level of control? So your most basic visceral reflexes are controlled at nuclei in... So your most basic of visceral reflexes are controlled by nuclei. Remember, nuclei, a cluster of cell bodies, somewhere in your spinal cord and your brain stem. These are quick, very much basic things like breathing and heart rate, things that you're never really over, never, you're never really conscious of these things. Now, more complex reflexes um, start moving up a little bit. So now we're going to be moving up to the medulla oblongata. So think the most primitive things are down in the brain stem and the spinal cord. More complex reflexes are going to start requiring higher structures, including the medulla. Now, once you get um, past the medulla, then you start getting up into the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is the headquarters for both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And remember that right there in this portion of the brain, you've got the limbic system, the thalamus, the cerebral cortex, all coming into close proximity. So this is going to tie together your emotional side of things, right? Your anger, um, also your cerebral cortex, your voluntary control over things. So it's going to bring together, for example, heart rate acceleration with anger. So if you're upset, it can increase your heart rate. Just being upset, the limbic system, the amygdala is, is uh, turned on, and now that can have an effect on your heart rate. And there's a continual feedback between your hypothalamus, your brain stem, and your higher brain stem, uh, higher brain centers. So follow this chart along, and you'll see that, um, again, the most basic of things, basic of ideas, um, are in the brain stem. Medulla oblongata, a big area of processing for very complex things related to your heart, your swallowing, coughing, respiratory functions, and those are going to um, send signals down your spinal cord there's also the possibility of these systems being uh, that, you're, that your voluntary part of your brain is made aware of these things. So if your breathing or heart rate becomes a problem, then certainly your cerebral cortex would be made aware of that to make voluntary changes. And remember that the limbic system is definitely in the middle of all this, uh, creating behavior and emotions and anger and memories, all of that that we discussed last chapter. So the autonomic nervous system, 
is very, very similar to the somatic nervous system. They both are integrated at many, many levels. So um, the brain, the conscious brain, the cortex, is definitely involved in influencing your autonomic nervous system and certainly controls your somatic nervous system. We're going to see that sensory information is involved with both. We're going to be triggering information coming in. There's going to be the possibility of integration of all this, sometimes just with the brainstem, sometimes with higher brain centers. And as I've been saying, you can influence your autonomic nervous system through your voluntary somatic nervous system. Let's take a look at this and try to make sense of all this. So let's say you have some information coming in, sensory receptors. Some of that information can come up and go short reflexes, completely ignore the central nervous system, and have an effect on an effector. Most of the time, though, we're going to go up and we're going to go into the central nervous system with long reflexes. We're going to go through an interneuron. We're going to be processed, and we're going to leave out autonomic nervous system, two neurons, right, preganglionic and postganglionic. It's also possible that that incoming sensory information is going to affect our skeletal muscles like a reflex, like you're going to pull away from a hot stove. Other sensory information is going to come up into the central nervous system and go into the brain stem. Now, that may be all it does. It may just come right back out, or it may continue and go up to the hypothalamus, or go up through the thalamus on its way into the cerebral cortex. The limbic system is always going to get involved here, and the cerebral cortex also directly affects the motor, but it also can um, influence through the limbic system. You can also have influence um, on your autonomic nervous system from your higher centers. So that conversation, um, go back now and use the guided reading that I provided for you. You'll find that guided reading um, posted on Blackboard. So go under Blackboard, go under Blackboard, go to Lecture 2, Materials, and there you'll find a guided reading. Now that guided reading is going to give you some major ideas, things that I definitely want you to be uh, comparing and contrasting. And as you go through this entire unit, in this unit, you're going to be comparing your voluntary versus your involuntary nervous system. In other words, they're saying that that's your somatic nervous system versus your autonomic nervous system. So that's one comparison you're going to keep making. You're also going to keep making comparisons between your parasympathetic nervous system versus the sympathetic. Okay. So as we went through this, think about all those systems, reactions in your body. You know what happens when you're scared. What are those bodily re reactions? And when you're chilling, what are those bodily reactions? And then as we move forward into the endocrine system, now you're going to start comparing endocrine system with the autonomic nervous system. And again, we're going to be heading into hormones and how hormones affect homeostasis. And then the autonomic nervous system, we saw all of those different body ref uh, reflexes and responses. So we're going to be looking at homeostasis and how these two systems, autonomic nervous system and endocrine system, help to maintain that homeostasis. So work through that guided reading. Uh, come see me with any questions. And hopefully uh, between what you've already learned and your reading of Chapter 14, you'll feel very comfortable with the autonomic nervous system.